Well, um, we're live streaming this on Facebook, and we are very short on time. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They've been long time open shifters. So um, they've got a lot to say, and they're doing some really cool stuff. So take it away. Oh, thanks, Diane. Uh, I'm Adios. Um, we're doing uh, IT services for travel industry for airlines. And we have been on the road with OpenShift since we started working on Kubernetes, so it's like four years now. We really love it. Every year we find new usages. We'll talk about this today. So it'll be Pierre, Olivier, and myself, Nenad. And Pierre, please start. Okay, so I will introduce you what is a data streaming architecture or what is commonly called uh, stream processing or real-time uh, data processing. It's a, it's a new kind of architecture that is event-driven. So everything is based on an event log. You need to have this persistent event log where every event that your application is, uh, is logging is uh, persistently stored in this event log in a strongly sequenced manner. So you, you have the guarantee that what you will consume is consumed exactly in the same order as it has been produced. And you need to uh, produce also immutable events because as it, it is persistent, you have this uh, uh, nice flexibility to be able to replay your events. So they need to be immutable so that you, you can replay them. Uh, so that, that's the principle. Your application writes events on, on this event log, and you can have uh, different processors that will handle those events. So uh, the very first uh, obvious use case is to uh, synchronize different data stores. Uh, it's very common those days to have an application uh, writing on different data stores. And instead of putting a stress on your application to write directly on those data stores, if your application is just logging the data change on this log asynchronously in an eventually consistent manner, you can synchronize uh, your, your different data stores. Here uh, I put uh, some examples, but uh, you can put as many processors as you, you need in parallel. And Jerry, uh, on the cake for this kind of architecture is that you can write your own uh, processor, applicative processor, that will do some kind of transformation, uh, uh, business logic on your events, and will produce a new event log as a result, and you can compose a full application with a, a, a graph of processors, uh, handling events, producing new events, and, and you can design your application in doing things in parallel or in sequence that way. You can see those processors as a kind of microservices, but streaming uh, microservices. So it's a very nice way to, to, uh, to design an asynchronous, event-driven application. Uh, this picture is not from me. It's from a guru of the, this principle called Martin Klippmann uh, that wrote a, a very nice book on, on, on this. <clears throat> so the, in terms of tooling, Apache Kafka is the leading open source to implement this kind of uh, event log. Uh, it, uh, it is thought for performances. It's very simple. Uh, and uh, in terms of scalability, the, the latency is very low. You have companies like uh, Netflix or Uber that are handling more than 12 million events per second through a set of Kafka clusters. So in terms of real-time uh, treatment, it's, uh, it's, it's there. Uh, and after, for the processor, uh, you have the choice. If you, you, you need uh, just a stateless uh, handling, you can write your own processor uh, by just uh, calling the Kafka API directly. Uh, things get a lot more complicated when you, you need to go stateful. And in that case, you have a set of open source available. Uh, one of them is Kafka Stream. That is quite simple. It's just a library that you can embed in, in your own processor. But you have Flink that is very popular uh, as well, uh, and uh, another set of, uh, of uh, processors. Spark streaming also is very present in this uh, world, but more on the big data. Uh, even if they, they did a continuous processor uh, recently, uh, Spark is, is rather positioned for big data. So doing aggregation, data aggregation uh, asynchronously. So in terms of advantage, uh, as you, you are uh, decomposing your application in this kind of asynchronous uh, uh, stream processing, you have this close coupling, so you, you can uh, tune and, and plug and play your microservice in this graph very, very uh, easily. So in terms of resilience, it's very, it's very nice. You have this scalability because you can deploy uh, your application widely on, on, on the cloud uh, without any problem. 
you, 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 you will put as many microservices as required for each stage of your application. It's very flexible because you have a graph, so you can plug in your graph a new microservice anywhere. Uh, in the example I, I gave, I, I had free data store uh, in parallel to update. If I need to add a new one, I just need to plug a new uh, consumer for my event log, event log that will write on this new data store. I will not impact at all the, the other microservices. And for the auditability and error recovery, it's very nice because you have every uh, event that is still present in the log. So you, you have this uh, uh, high visibility of what happened on your system. If you put a high, high retention on, on your event log, uh, one week, several months, if you have the capacity, uh, in terms of uh, error recovery, you can replay uh, your events uh, as far as required in the past to, to recover your bug. So this is an example huh, of a typical architecture that you can build uh, with uh, this principle of streaming. It's a standard uh, lambda architecture with three layers. So first layer, ingesting your data, parsing them, in parallel, archiving your raw data. So you, you can also uh, replay uh, very, very old events if you need from this archive. You transform your, your, your data into whatever uh, required in terms of materials view for your for the event, and then you, you can detect on the next stage the functional events uh, that you, 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 you had on your, on your input stream. And in parallel, you can store your events on a hot data store for uh, uh, real-time consumption, for example, via, via REST service. So that's the data ingestion part, and then you have those two layers, big data that will uh, handle uh, those data via an, an Hadoop uh, store first. And you can see here that in parallel, The, the data are, are stored in Hadoop, in the ODS, uh, and in different parts of the architecture, all in parallel. So big data on the top, and real-time business layer on the bottom, where you can have business rule, for example, interpreting your, your functional events and doing some actions, or any kind of business process you can plug on, on your graph. So this is just a, a typical graph. Uh, you can compose your microservice as you need. This kind of architecture is very nice for what we call data-driven, because in, in, that, in that model, you can have the, your big data layer, analyzing your data in an offline process, producing insights of what, what you analyzed, and pushing those insights again in the data ingestion part, so that your, your business layer can interpret those insights and decide, take actions, according to them. So it's what we call data-driven. That's you put intelligence in your application based on the data analytics you did on the BI part. So for example, the business rule could, could use those insights. Uh, another aspect also of data-driven is machine learning. So you can, you can have your machine learning model that is built on the big data layer, and you can deploy dynamically the, the microservice handling the uh, machine learning model in the business layer in real time. So it's very nice way to, uh, to do this kind of, uh, of uh, data ingestion, data processing in real time. So that's for the high level concepts. And I will leave the floor to Nenad for the implementation part of Kafka on OpenShift. So how do we run uh, architectures like this in OpenShift? Well, first thing we need to run Kafka. And well, uh, Kafka and OpenShift didn't fit very well some time ago because Kafka, you have a stateful application, you have a cluster, every broker has unique identity, you need persistent storage, you need actually another cluster, which is Zookeeper. And in uh, OpenShift, you would get your pod names like randomish, like, like there. So thankfully, we have a stateful sets now. Uh, when we started, they were called pet sets, and they were beta, not supported, but they are there now. And um, We can use it. So what is the great thing that comes with the stateful set? So first, they have right stable pod identity, meaning that now our Kafka brokers can have a, a like, correct names, like Kafka 0, Kafka 1, Kafka 2, no longer random thing. They provide stable storage. You will get your persistent storage for the given pod always, even if it moves. And there are new things like uh, ordered startup, and ordered shutdown, and rolling upgrades. So it actually uh, runs Fine. We have been running for one year, think a load like this, uh, behaving very well, happy with it. And some experiences. So when Kafka is a stateful application, it's pretty much disk 
uh, performance is disk-based and network-based, so you want to run it on a good machines, like having SSDs. So using network affinity allows you to do this. Uh, sorry, not affinity, allows it to do this. Load, loading on the machines with the SSD, with the disk label. But also you want to sp spread it across different machines because you don't lose all your cluster if one machine goes down. That's when anti-affinity comes in. And then some counterintuitive um, findings. So common wisdom, if you lose your persistent volume, if, uh, use persistent volumes because if you lose your uh, pods, you will lose your data. But in the data streaming architecture, if the time life of your data is few minutes, you will not have an enormous amount of data. So you can actually rely on Kafka replication, which basically means you can rely on empty DRs. So on a local storage, there are no longer, not yet, there local persistent volumes that will be coming. But you can rely on a local uh, volume on the SSD and having very high performance in Kafka. And we will be using Prometheus and JMake for monitoring this one. So it's fine, we can have Kafka brokers running there and we can consume this Kafka, but it's not the only thing you need when you're running Kafka. You need to have to configure it for the applications, for the topics. You have, I have dozens or several dozens of microservices running at once in this platform. Each is consuming from a topic and producing to one or several topics. And we want to be sure that those topics exist in each and every environment. Uh, and we want to be sure that they're deleted if they're no longer used. We want to be um, able to react on how much disk is there, disk space is there. So reduce retention time or increase retention time. Give credentials to the clients, and ideally, want actually developers to express this thing. It's not, it's not that they want to write a work order to someone and then someone has to type these commands. What we would like really to use, and what we do is. And I think it will be subject to many subject, uh, many talks. Is actually we use operator. I had just mentioned in the talk before. We have a Kafka operator which is basically monitoring a resource existing in a, uh, OpenShift. In our case, it's a config map. It can be a custom resource, and this one describes the topic. It's characteristics like how many partitions, what is the replication factor, specific properties. And whenever it changes, it will apply these changes automatically on the Kafka cluster it controls. So there is no actually human error anymore involved. The operator is replacing this thing. It's, it's great. Range is actually equivalent to the, when you mention service catalog, it's equivalent to the provision and provision kind of service catalog. And it can also deliver credentials to your microservices if you want to have a secured environment. So we solve having Kafka, running Kafka inside uh, uh, OpenShift. We have also have this operator. We actually we share these ideas with different actors, Red Hat also. I think there will be some announcements on this uh, summit around it uh, about uh, uh, similar kind of tools. Um, and there is the next thing is you have your platform with dozens of microservices there. And it can get the kind of difficult to understand what's going on inside. Because it's, okay, it's no longer a monolith. It's easy to deploy one service. They're all decoupled. But somehow your platform is not all decoupled. You have to understand what's going on. And it would be great if we can define your platform in advance and you can test it and replicate it against. So here comes another operator. Uh, we call that actually a uh, platform template tool. Uh, operator, where we ha give possibility to uh, our uh, architects and our uh, developers and designers to design the workflow inside uh, uh, a data-driven application. And actually, when you look here, this is a uh, uh, screenshot from there. Each blue box represents a deployment config inside of OpenShift. Each blue arrow represents a communication which will be mapped to a uh, uh, Kafka topic. So uh, the operator will actually monitor another config map and saying, okay, I need to deploy all these microservices. All, uh, I'll need to define all these topics. I'll configure it and I'll keep my cluster my, uh, in consistent applicative state. So you can do it visually. You can do it uh, uh, as code because I, uh, eventually it's a YAML. Uh, 
but it can also be used not only for this design part, you can use for this uh, for uh, operator part, because from a view like this, we can go directly to an OpenShift console, or we can actually, as we are using our open uh, tracing to uh, trace messages across different uh, microservices, we can identify if my microservice is behaving or not. So, so all this fine, it's a great thing for uh, um, data-driven applications. At the Amadeus, we are using Kafka also for some others, and I'm leaving uh, to Olivier to talk about it. Okay, so I will finish uh, with a concrete application where we stand with the use of Kafka for a large scale application. We, have, we are speaking about thousands of nodes, especially for what we call the shopping, the capability to search and price products that we sell at Amadeus. Uh, usually the, the business is to uh, file new availability, new pricing, uh, and then we need to propagate these uh, changes into the nodes, the thousands of nodes. We have a first level of cache, but uh, if we have all the nodes targeting this cache at the same time, then it's uh, the recipe for a failure. So we have a second level of cache at the each node level, and we need to send the invalidation of those caches uh, with large uh, burst of invalidations. We speak about 20,000 uh, invalidation per second with large bursts coming uh, as all, all of a sudden. So the, the, the algorithm is clearly you send the, the notification and then if you're interested, then you pick up the data for the central cache in case it's interesting for you. Um, Kafka, in this picture, uh, we are not at the streaming level, but this is where we target to go. Uh, we use very small messages, 200 bytes, because we know that it will very, very well scale. Uh, we have a good stability, and we manage to contain the cluster size, the Kafka cluster size. Uh, we use JSON format for sending the messages. Uh, today is deployed with Ansible, and typically what we are looking at is a deployment with an OpenShift operator and an operator. Uh, the stream analysis and the decision mechanism to fetch data is enriched, uh, and then we'll try to convey more and more metadata in the messages at the same time keeping the messaging as small as possible. And this picture, we do have Couchbase, so, so this is the central cache. This is where we store terabytes of, of data, and sometimes it changes, most, more than sometimes. Uh, we dissociate the notification from the content in this application because it's far too big. The number of fetches being largely smaller than the number of notifications sent to the nodes. Uh, where do we see uh, our evolution? Uh, today we use Kafka as a data bus. We use a cross data center replication mechanism. Uh, when we transfer the data from one data center to another one, to one uh, region in the cloud to the other one, uh, we have a large interest in, again, in the use of Kafka. Uh, with operators because it simplifies drastically the operation and the deployment of the clusters. We can speak about deploying a new Kafka cluster on the spot as an increase and scale up the, the cluster. So basically, uh, we are at the, the beginning of uh, how streaming can be used at a very, very large scale. We look at the, the architecture presented by Pierre with a large interest, and we have a large interest in the Kubernetes operators. So this is the end of my speech. We don't have time for, for, for questions. Uh, you can uh, reach us. We're there. We will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you.